Hello everyone, Zach here from the Carnival of Randomness on behalf of our sponsor, Opsitnik and Associates. In these unprecedented times, we reflect on our future, both in the next few weeks and months, but also the upcoming years and decades, and it's time to prepare for that future. Opsitnik and Associates has been contacted by many healthcare workers, as well as old and new clients, to prepare wills, powers of attorney, and advanced directives, also called a living will. All of you need these documents, so don't say you don't have any assets to speak of, no children or other dependents. Regardless of the circumstances now, you will need a will for today and tomorrow. Al Upsitnik feels so strongly about having wills and other needed documents prepared that Upsitnik and Associates can prepare your will, power of attorney, and living will at no charge, you heard that correct, no charge until the end of 2020. No hidden fees or gimmicks. Al feels so strongly about planning for the future at this time that he is willing to assist you with your future. Trust Opsitnik and Associates, attorneys for 42 years, from the Supreme Court to Alaska and everywhere in between. You can find them online, OpsitniksLaw.com, on Facebook, Opsitnik and Associates, or call them toll-free, 1-866-391-3299 to prepare for your future. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Carnival of Randomness. And I'm joined once again by the diehard football fanatic, Rye. Hello. Hello? Oh, oh. Oh, there you are. Nah, mic problem. Ah, mic problem, yes. But anyway, Rye is here, and what we were going to do for the next two episodes, so bear that in mind as you listen to the second part of this, we are sitting here a few days before the Sunday portion of the week 12 of the NFL, correct? Yep. <laughs> and I figured what we would do to beat the uh to beat the crowd, we would do the NFL season in three quarter review since we're about three quarters of the way through arguably the craziest season I've ever seen in my life. Oh. And so we're we're going to do in this first part is we're going to take a look at the NFC, look at where they are, and then see if at the start of the season we thought this is how it would be. So if you're ready, we will start with ye olde AFC East. NFC East? Uh, AFC East. You said we were doing NFC. No, sorry, AFC. Okay. Um, so we're looking at the AFC East, and as of right now, the Bills, of all things, are sitting atop the division at 7-3. and three. Yeah. <laughs> Go back to the beginning of the season. Did you see that this? No. I mean, I think everybody expected the Patriots to be a little worse just because of the big divorce. Yeah. But nobody expected them to be third in the division. Right, and... You know, and that's why I think I'm kind of surprised that it's the Bills that are sitting on top of the division. Yeah, you know, I think there was, I think people probably expected the Dolphins just because of all the hype around Tua. Right, and uh, I do think the way they handled the Tua Fitzpatrick thing wasn't the best. Yeah. Uh, Especially with the fact that Ryan was playing very well for them. And then Tua did come in and play uh, better than I think a lot of people expected. Which is why they're sitting, what, one game behind Buffalo at 6-4 and four right now. Um, so that's definitely weird. You know, I think people expected the Patriots to be a worse, but still number one. You know, maybe drop two or three more games, but still lead the division. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I definitely, uh, even before the season really started, I made a bet with uh, one of my cousins. I bet five bucks that uh, Miami would win the division. Yeah, and, uh, you know, the them picking up Cam, like, I was a, I'm not a Patriots fan, but I like Cam as, you know, as a person and a player, so I thought he would really help the team, but unfortunately, no. Corona, yeah, Corona Chan has wrecked his world. Yeah, and, you know, the fact sitting there at four and six right now, uh, but weirdly, every team in the AFC East, obviously the Jets, but we'll get to them in a second. Uh, they're all coming off a loss last week. Mm. Uh, the Bills lost, the Dolphins lost, etc. So let's let's talk briefly about the New York Jets. Um, 
It's not a team name, it's an acronym. No, it kind of is. But sitting down at the bottom of the entire NFL, mathematically eliminated from playoff contention last week, uh, at 0-10. Yep, franchise record. Uh, yeah, franchise record. So let's let's be honest. 10, 12 weeks ago, did you imagine the Jets at 0-10 with the possibility of ending the 16-game season era by going 0-16? No. Again, you expected them to be bad, but you're sort of looking at Bengals bad. You know, it- Two, you know, two eight, you know that kind yeah, exactly. of area. You, you'd think two and eight, maybe three and seven, possibly at the worst one and nine. Yeah, but but you didn't expect them to not win a single game. Well, and it's not just that; it's what they've been doing to to lose these games the the bad decisions, yeah, the bad play, the bad trades. Why in the world you would trade Avery Williamson, your best linebacker? Well, and then they also dumped Levy on. Well, that didn't really have any effect because, let's be honest, Bell wasn't doing much for them. Oh, no, but, I mean, that was also on them. I mean, he's he's doing much better with the Chiefs. Isn't that, isn't that weird that uh, Bell escaped the Jets and went to the Chiefs, Williamson escaped the Chiefs, and, or uh, escaped the uh, Jets and went to the Steelers? Yep. Two of the happiest <laughs> men in the NFL right there. You know, so it's just, yeah, you know. It's it's kind of hilarious in a sad sort of way to think that they're going to be part of that very exclusive club of no wins. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, really in the modern era, it's happened three times, as we you and I talked earlier today. Yeah. The 1976 uh, Tampa Bucks. Bay Buccaneers, their inaugural season went 0-14. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the Lions, did we ever figure out what year it was the Lions that did that? Uh, let's see, 0 16 Lions. 2008, okay, I was right. Then, so nothing until 2008, the Lions went 0 16. Then it was what, two or three years later? 2017, the Browns. Oh, it was that much removed? Okay, yeah, and then the 2017 Browns. Which, honestly, in six weeks' time, as we're recording this, could be joined by the 0 16 New York Jets. I mean, looking at. We looked at their schedule and what they have left, and. You know, there are not many games where they would be, you know, expected to win. No, I think the only possibility was the final game of the year in January when it would be them against the Patriots. And maybe the hope that the Patriots would sit any starters that they have left. Right, but at this point, right now the Patriots making the playoffs, even with the new seven-team thing, is not a guarantee. No. So, you know, yeah, it seems like, you know, almost guaranteed at this point that they will have the the perfect unseason. Very possibly. And again, <laughs> we've talked about this at some length. How ridiculously hard is it to go 0-16? That's the thing, because you can win a game without winning it, right? The other team can lose a game, and the fact that you win is kind of a byproduct. Right. In some, in some cases, you can purely win a game by making fewer mistakes. Exactly. You know, the other team just has a meltdown and loses at the last, you know, last couple of minutes. You know, or let's say, just in a weird example, not like this would ever happen, five offensive holding penalties on one drive. Hmm, wonder who you're talking yeah, about. We're looking at, in the direction of you, Indianapolis. You know, or look at that uh, crazy 2015 uh, playoff game between the Steelers and the Bengals, the one that's infamous for Burfick's hit on Antonio Brown. Oh, the one that is the urban legend is that started all of the shenaniganry. Yeah, but they the Bengals were about to win that one. Yeah, and then they and... collapsed. I remember I was telling you, I was watching that game on TV, and I was about to turn it off. Mm-hmm. But for some reason, I didn't. And then I watched, I was able to behold the most ridiculous meltdown in such a short period of time I'd ever seen. What was it? Two personal fouls within five plays? On, yeah, on, on Cincinnati? The, it was the same play because Perfect hit AB, and then, you know, that started a lot of arguments on the field. And in that series of <laughs> arguments, uh, Pac Man Jones made contact with a referee. Yeah, exactly. So. 
That's 30 yards just in penalties right there. On one play. Yeah, and there's I believe no way that ended come the... back from that. No, I believe the Steelers kicked the field goal one, and that was going to be the Bengals' first trip. I think trip to the playoffs ever. Or, no, no, they well they went to the Super Bowl back in the eighties. Oh, well, not ever, but you know, in a long in, in a long time, years. it was it would be their first time out of the wild card round in a while. Um, you know, so it meant a lot, and that you know, so that's a case where the Steelers didn't win that game; the Bengals lost it. And I remember because the following week, the Steelers actually I think lost to Denver. Yeah. Was God. that, I think that was Manning's last season? Uh, or Tebow? No, it was either, it was one of those two, but I remember even despite the fact that the Steelers lost to the Broncos the following week, I was more angry at the end of the Steelers Bengals game than angry that the Steelers had been knocked out of the playoffs. Yeah, you know, Just but that's of sort of everything that had transpired. Well, exactly, but that's sort of a case where, you know, snatching defeat from the jaws of victory and the fact that the Steelers won was a byproduct. So you would expect that eventually the Jets would have a situation. They might meet, uh, you know, an opposing team that has a meltdown. Yeah, you, just through blind luck, you would yeah. think that they were going to win a game. But then you got to look at it, are they doing it to tank? I don't think they're doing it intentionally. I think I I'm sorry, yeah, I don't know. I I don't think it was at first. I think now they may have accepted their fate. I it very well could be because they know they're going to get the number 1 pick. I mean, and, you and I talked about it a little bit a while ago where two things can both be true at the same time that are not, you know, mutually exclusive. You can be incompetent and you can be tanking. Right. But in this case I think I, they're both. I think it's it's definitely, there's definitely incompetence, but... Oh, God, yeah. You um, know, and I think that they reached a point now where starting to win at this stage would do nothing except move them out of the draft. No, literally, even if they won out the rest of the season, they're not going to go to the playoffs at 6-10, and 10, unless you're in the, a the NFC, but we'll come to that next week. You know, so it would do absolutely nothing. They want Trevor Lawrence. Yeah, and I don't think Trevor Lawrence wants them, but we're... we're <laughs> Let's just put it this way. Come April, we'll see what happens. You know, so yeah, I think that, you know, I think for a lot of it is incompetence, but at the same time, I think they may have just decided to basically roll with their incompetence instead of trying to fix it, which, you know, to me is a form of tanking. Yeah, it, it's the acceptance tanking. You know, they're not deliberately, you know, sort of fluffing it, but they're not trying to be any better than they are, which, you know, no. as bad as they are, that's kind of unacceptable. Exactly. You know, it's not hard to be better than the Jets. <laughs> they could improve a little bit. A little bit, yeah, but I don't think they're going to. They're yeah, they seem to not be inclined to even try to do that. No. <laughs> All well, right, and well, let's moving on. Well, let's flop ends of the country. I'm just going down in the order I see it. We're going to go to the AFC West. All right. So we got Chiefs, Raiders, Broncos, and Chargers. In that order, mm -hmm. we got the Chiefs at nine and one, Raiders at six and four, Broncos four and six, the Chargers three and seven. Uh, big surprises there for me. I think the biggest one is the Chargers. I kind of expected that. I mean, I know everybody, you know, the flashy new quarterback, right, Justin Herbert, but. Uh, you know, watching his college play, and he has that very sort of Jekyll and Hyde. Yeah, he's because he's and he's still so young, and that's the thing. Well, that's with it. So many, you know, and that's what's going to separate the flash in the pan rookie quarterbacks from the guys that are going to turn into a Ben Roethlisberger or a Philip Rivers or a Drew Brees. Well, and speaking of Phil, I, I mean, I think any time you get a rookie and then you immediately throw them to the wolves with nobody to mentor them, I think you're asking for problems. Yeah, exactly. So even if, you know, and that's why I think Tua came in and did well, because he sat those, what, first six or seven games on the bench and was being mentored by Ryan Fitzpatrick. And obviously, we've talked about him before, Ryan Fitzpatrick, not really going to be a Hall of Fame consideration. No, but, but he's the got fact all the intent. He's, he's had a 16-year NFL career 
uh, throughout the league has done. He are uh, like I say, he will go down probably as the greatest journeyman quarterback in the history of the game. Well, exactly, you know. So I think that was always going to be a problem for Herbert. Like yeah. he plays well, but the inexperience counts, and you can sort of see that here and there. And I think that's just the latest case of the Chargers being such a badly run organization. Well, exactly, and that's and that just proved because they had a, a good amount of talent. They had Philip Rivers for sixteen years and couldn't do anything. They had Drew Brees and Philip Rivers, and they couldn't do anything. Well, exactly, they had the first five or first four or five years of Drew Brees' career. Yep, didn't do anything. Or actually, be what four years, three years. Yeah, I think three, but you know, so. I think they just have so many problems in that organization. I'm not really surprised that they're terrible, you I, know. See, I think I, it's still a bit of a surprise to me. I feel a little bad for <laughs> Herbert, but at the same time, it's... I I kind of chuckle because this is exactly what they did to Phil. You know, so I've always been sort of like, well, sorry, kid, but get used to it. You have 16 years of this before they dump you. Well, exactly, and... um. You're going to go in and play lights out and put three or four touchdowns on the board, and it will not matter because the moment you step off the field... Yeah, and I think, honestly, next year is going to be the telling year as to what kind of player he's going to be. How is he going to bounce back from a disappointing first year? You know, but I mean, so, so many of the problems aren't him, and, you know, we'll see if the... If they've learned anything, they've they've ruined two quarterbacks now, or or sort of pissed away their career, you know, their careers with the organization. Let's see if they do it to a third. Very possible. Right, Let's see the, if they actually get him help. What do you think about the Broncos? What's going on with them? Um, I guess they're kind of what they are. I mean, Drew Locke is Drew Locke. I'm not exactly. really Exactly. I wasn't expecting him to set the world on fire, so kind of at four and six right now is pretty much where I thought they would be by this point. Um The Raiders, I mean, they're they they have a winning uh record at the moment. I think I thought they might be doing a, a little better. Uh, see, I thought they were gonna be right around here because I just I don't know. I, I had a feeling that they were going to probably end the season at like, you know, a nine and seven kind of thing. There, they, they, they still might. I guess for me, it was sort of the riding all the hype. Right, they moved to Vegas. They got their uh, their Death Star yeah, stadium. They got, they got the big ominous black bowl in the middle of the desert. You know, it just it seemed like there was kind of a lot of hype, a lot of momentum. Uh, they, uh, you know, they got rid of uh, Mister Big Chest. Yeah. All, all the distractions, you know, so I felt a little better about their their chances once he was gone. I don't, for some reason though, I I just didn't see it happening for him this year. Hmm. Don't know why, but I just didn't. And the Chiefs are the Chiefs. You knew they were going to be a wrecking ball. Well, exactly. You know, there is and then we talked about the tinfoil hat theory. Yeah, I think we're gonna have to do an entire episode yeah, about that, that. That'll be a, that'll be an episode for as the playoffs begin. We're gonna do the tinfoil hat theory, so we're not gonna spoil that. But you and I know what we're talking about. Um, but I mean, you know, just the the combination of of Reed, who's really good, and Mahomes, who's really good. Well, and that's the thing. Uh, Patrick Mahomes is very good. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's no two ways around it. He is a he is a terrifying force in the NFL. You know, so I think they're the new they're the new dynasty, right? I, I as soon think as so. the Patriots collapse, it's replaced by Reed and Mahomes. Right, and honestly, um, I have the utmost respect for Andy Reed. I think a lot of people in the world do. Yeah, he's a really good coach. I was really glad to see him win his Super Bowl, his first Super Bowl as a head coach. Yeah, was it his first or? Cause yeah, I think it was as an assistant, right? Um, maybe. <laughs> yeah, but, but yeah, I was really, really happy for him. Uh, and it's one of those things I've never really minded the Chiefs as an organization. Yeah, you know they they are what they are. They came in from the AFL, so a lot of people have that affinity t- towards them, and you know they've been a pretty good team for a long time. Mm. 
Well, exactly. They're continuing to prove it now, and right now they're doing it good. They've built something good, and it's going to last for a couple more years. Exactly. So, All right. AFC North. Mm. Your favorite division. So we got the Steelers sitting on top of the mountain of the NFL at 10-0. and 0. Yep. The Browns at 7-3, and three, the Ravens 6-4, and four, and the Bungholes at 2-7-1. and one. Let, Let's go from the bottom up. Uh, Bengals, I saw, the, everybody saw it coming. Nobody thought they were going to do much. Well, that's it. I didn't get on the Burrow hype because, again, you're looking at an organization where the problems are way beyond the quarterback, so the fact that they have a quarterback is irrelevant. Exactly, and you, you feel bad for Joe Burrow after the horrific, horrific knee injury. Yeah, but, and you, you really, know... You, you, you wish the best for him, you really do, because he has the potential... I mean, up until he got hurt, he, the, the, the team record did not really tell the tale of how he was playing as a quarterback. Yeah, individually, he was playing lights out, you know, but yeah. you knew it was... That something was going to happen because it's a dysfunctional organization. Right. The Bengals caught up with them because they never really invested in that offensive line. Yeah, so either he was going to get hurt or they were just going to ruin him anyway just because they're, you know, they're badly run. And it's a shame that it ha- that it, there's a chance it might be both. Um, hopefully yeah. he's able to come back and continue yeah. it because, like I say, he really, he came in and he was on track to be great. Yeah, it was the Deshaun Watson thing again, the the amazing rookie season that's now been ended, and, you know, it'll be a perpetual what-if. Right, so hopefully he can come back and add to that. Well, yeah, but, you know, that rookie season is over now, so... Yeah, exactly, Ex- exactly. Mm-hmm. And it, But it ended, unfortunately, it didn't end the way he wanted it to, but he established himself as a guy who knows how to play football at a very young stage in his career. Yeah, you know, so I just sort of feel like until the Bengals figure out how to invest in, you know, a good offensive line and to protect him, I think he's always going to have some struggles there. Yeah, agreed. He's he's going to be constantly injured or just Running for eventually, his eventually his confidence will collapse because, yeah, he's going to be constantly running. You know, teams will figure him out and his, you know... Uh, his numbers will go down. All right, well, that's actually a lovely segue. Speaking of teams figuring them out, let's look at Baltimore. Mm. Uh, as we record this, it, uh, they've delayed the game, the Steelers-Ravens game, twice. But <laughs> I wanted to flip a table. You look at a 6-4 and four Baltimore Ravens that's coming off of a two-game losing streak. Mm-hmm. I didn't see, I honestly thought they'd be a little better, and now it's looking very apparent. Lamar Jackson may not be as good as everybody wants him to, wants to believe he is. You know, um, it's sort of the, the hype thing, right? Like, everybody gets excited every time these, these young guys come in and they're, they put up a flashy rookie year and all of a sudden everybody's just saying, sort of expecting that they're going to continue on that well, line, and right? And that's what it is. He came in in 2018, if I, correct? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, he came in 2018. He had a really solid rookie year. Mm. He came out last year, had a monster season. You know, obviously, yeah. what, NFL MVP, and I think rightfully so. He had a hell of a season. Yeah. This year, he, they... I don't know what it is. I think I one of the announcers on a game I was watching just said they look off. Yeah. And I think that's what it is. Something is going on. They're they're just completely out of sync. Uh and as the game against who did they lose to last week? Was it Tennessee uh, or was it Houston? Uh I think it was Tennessee. It was Tennessee. Oh yeah, because Tennessee jumped out early on. Yeah, they lost uh, 30 to 24. Yeah, so the Tennessee jumped out early on them, and I was actually speaking with my mom about it, and I said, you watch, if Tennessee jumps out early, Lamar Jackson has a lot of difficulty playing from behind. Yeah. And with the loss against Tennessee, now his record, when he's trailing at the end of the first quarter, now moves to a whopping 1-6. I think that's, I think that's an experience thing. 
it definitely is, but mm -hmm. it's it, it's rough when you can't really turn it around after being down in the first quarter. It definitely is. I mean, that may change, but I just it's sort of it's the rushing quarterback thing for me, right? Yeah. Um, I think it's I think it's a gimmick. I think you know people seem to have sort of forgotten that you know Michael Vick was a thing that they've had rushing quarterbacks before and they don't actually tend to last very long no uh be and especially if they really are incapable of backing it up with a throwing arm uh lamar jackson is not that though he does have a quite a good arm yeah but the fact of the matter is if you're more more one-dimensional like you love to run and take off they are going to figure it out and that's what's happened this year is teams have figured Lamar Jackson out. Like, even Tennessee, their uh, pass defense isn't one of the best. Mm -hmm. They were containing him very easily. Well, that's sort of it. So I just sort of, you know, for me, that's sort of, yeah, what it is. I just think that people have kind of figured him out, that the whole rushing quarterback thing was never going to last. Right. You know, he was not going to be able to sustain a 16 or 17 year career, you know, rushing for 1200 yards every year. Oh my God. No. I mean, cause look at the, look at the old guard quarterbacks that are around and you would not really classify any of them as the rushing mobile type. No, cause eventually you slow down with age. And the bigger problem is of course, once you rush out of that pocket, you start getting hit. Well, right. But I mean, even in their prime, in their youth, none of them were really rushing quarterbacks like no Phil, not Phillip at all. rivers wouldn't exactly have been considered a, a running qb no you know uh, tom brady drew Brees, roethlisberger you know yeah. ryan fitzpatrick matt schaub all these guys that are in their 16 17th plus year yeah you know so it's just yeah i think uh, i Thought they would be doing a little better, but... I did too, you know. but, and uh, here, another great segue. I certainly didn't think that coming into week 12 that Baltimore would be third in the division. The factory of sadness. Yeah, behind the 7-3 and three Cleveland Browns, which is strange to say considering the Browns return to the NFL in 99 and what they've done since then. Well, exactly. You know, so, you know, being one that, of the fabled two zero and 16 teams. Yeah. Um, so that's been a, you know, a real surprise. And the fact is they're, they're pulling it off. They're coming in and they're beating teams that I'm shocked they're beating. So, yeah, and even more surprising that they're doing it without sort of anywhere from two to three key members. I mean, obviously, OBJ's been gone for a while for the season for his leg injury. Yeah, and, um, you know, Nick, uh, Garrett, Ch Nick Chubb's yeah, been hit and miss in the run game. Uh, I think he's been injured a couple of games. Yeah, he's been out a few games, but he's back now, which has really given their running game a boost. Uh, Miles Garrett's, I think, been out one or two games with injuries. Well, he's not as good as the world wants to think he is. Um, but it's just sort of like so they've they're doing it even without some of their some of their guys. And to be fair, they're doing it with a quarterback who is basically on the verge of getting put into free agent land. Yeah. The uh, the Baker Mayfield cycle. Yeah, and in all honesty, I will not understand how the Browns are sitting at seven and three right now, but they are. Yeah. So that's surprising. All right. What about the Steelers? Uh, did I think that at week 12, they would be undefeated? No, absolutely not. Unleash the Yinzer. <laughs> I, that, that, that might be trademarked by some other channel that we're not going to talk about until we can get a deal with them. Yeah. But, no, in all honesty, did I think the Steelers would be 10-0? and 0? No way in hell. I thought yeah. they would be good because of the team they had built that you could tell, and especially if you look into the contracts and the money of the whole team, you could tell they were, gun they were building up for one run. Yeah. Because they're going to lose a lot of dudes next year just for cap reasons. Mm-hmm. So um, they they built a team, 
And they well, that's it. Eight. What's that? Well, yeah, and, you know, and you and I looked at this going through the roster and when each guy, you know, joined up and they've been working on this team, some of the older guys, for a decade. Yeah, some of the older guys. And then over the past four years especially is mm-hmm. really when they've been starting to acquire the the missing pieces. You know, they got T.J. Watt, they got James Conner, they got Juju Smith-Schuster, they got Chase Claypool. Exactly. All the, you know, yeah, the young guys who have come in the last few years. So, and they're, yeah. And this they're is... bringing in some big key free agents. You know, they brought in uh, Alu Alu, and he's been playing really well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> They brought in, uh, well, just middle of this season, Avery Williamson from the Jets. You know, yeah, he is the stigma of coming from the Jets, but he was their best linebacker by far. Well, exactly. You know, so. But obviously coming into the season after, you know, the absolutely rotten 8-8, eight and eight, which was impressive with what they well, had. Considering because... the fact of what they were playing against, yeah, it's amazing they finished at 500. Um, but just how bad last year was, you know, after after Ben went down and they had to play with Doc. Yeah, with, Hod- with Hodges and Rudolph. Ugh. It's amazing that they came out of that season winning any games, let alone eight. And obviously coming into this season, you know, the sort of big storyline for them was, is Ben done? You know, is he washed? When your, like, 38-year-old quarterback that's... has major elbow surgery. And that's the thing. My God, he is playing some great football. Yeah, you know. I mean, they say he's playing some of the best football of his career, and he's in year 17. Yeah. So that's been really surprising. I mean, I I always wanted to hope, you know, like yeah, you, you want to pull for the big guy, but yeah, you kind of have to be realistic, you know. I mean, teams cut quarterbacks for way less than that at younger ages. That's why the uh, Chargers dropped Drew. Right, he got his shoulder injured, and he yeah, was way was, younger. Yeah, it was. Um, they had. They had drafted Rivers in 2000... Well, they had drafted Eli Manning in 2004, but... Yeah. They ended up with Rivers in 2004, and that's when Breeze hurt his shoulder, and they, they, they let him go, and the Saints ended up with him starting in 2005, and that's when... Or no, because he played into 2005 as well. I think it was 2006 when he yeah, was injured. Yeah, because Phil played... Only two games in 2004, two games in 2005, and then he hasn't missed a game since 2006. But, I mean, Drew was young when that happened, and they dropped him like a, you know, bad habit. Yeah, he was only in his, I think at that point it would have been his fifth year. You know, so when you're looking at, yeah, an almost 40-year-old quarterback? Yeah. You know, who has a shoulder injury, and, and yet the franchise stuck by him? Exactly, and... You know, you know, thankfully so, because, yeah. Ben, and what's... Ben's playing inspired football. Yeah, what's sort of fascinating is how he's he's completely changed the type of football that he's playing. Because of his injury, they completely changed the offense from these long street ball plays that he's he lo- spent his career, entire career doing where he holds onto the ball for four or five seconds. Yeah, to now... now the real... He's statistically the fastest release quarterback in the league. Exactly. You know, he's got that snap release. And and I think another good thing and why he was able to do it is you look at the youth and speed of his receivers. Yeah. Like you got Chase Claypool and Juju Smith-Schuster. They can get down the field in a hurry. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. It's he really couldn't do it easy without... for him to take a three-step drop and snap a, snap a pass off and get 10 yards. You know, so but I just think it's fascinating because I think it's really difficult for uh, any quarterback at any stage of the game to completely change how they play. But obviously, after 17 years, yeah, of playing one way, yeah, to to switch it up like that, it's um, it's highly impressive, and it, it it really is it really is cool. Like you know, don't get me wrong. I, 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 if somebody would have told me that, oh yeah, the Steelers are going to be the last undefeated team at 10 and 0, I would have been like, yeah, I wish. Exactly. You know, you thought, you hoped that they would, uh, you know, at least be winning, but yeah. I, you didn't I think honestly, they were I figured 
uh, I legitimately figured they would go probably 12 and four and get the wild card spot because I figured the that Baltimore would win the division. I think everybody fig- I, there's still articles up uh, from not that long ago that uh, have anticipated Baltimore winning, you know, that said that the AFC matchup would be Baltimore versus somebody else. Yeah, well, that's looking. And now the Ravens have gone from the preseason, we're going to dominate the entire AFC North to they're going to have to claw to make it to the playoffs. Yeah. All right, up to the AFC South. Yeah, the AFC South, we've got... From the top, we've got the Colts on top through the tiebreaker, but they're tied record-wise with the Titans at 7-3. and three. The Texans, coming off a surprising Thanksgiving ass-kicking. Yeah, of the Lions. Of the Lions. And the Jaguars, who, if they lose to Cleveland on Sunday, are mathematically eliminated from the playoffs at 1-9. and nine. <laughs> Uh, well, let's start with the Jags. Did you think they would be 1-9? and nine? I didn't think they'd be that bad, but I, I within a game, maybe two. You knew they were going to be bad. They haven't been good in a long time. Yeah, I, I figured they would probably end up at the bottom of the division. I was thinking probably 4-10, and 5-11. and 11. But... So yeah, basically somewhere like where the Texans are. Right, Because you expect yeah. the Texans to be better, so the Jags would still be at the bottom, but with, yeah, more of like a 4-7. and seven. Yeah. Uh, we're going to skip over the Texans for a minute because there's a lot to unpack with the Texans. Yeah. Uh, let's look at the Titans. Sitting at 7-3, and three, I'm not real surprised because of the uh, the playoff run they had last year. Uh, Ryan Tannehill really starting to show that he still can play football and you have Derrick Henry who's still a monster yeah but again when you're sort of you know when so much is carried by one guy most of those three losses have come from teams that you know were able to to uh, contain Henry well yeah because the, the Steelers did a good job containing Henry for most of the game you know, and if you can do that, the team really does seem to struggle. Right, because that's their bread and butter. And if you take that away, it's a little harder for Tannehill to make up for it than it would be for, you know, a Lamar Jackson type or a Patrick Mahomes type. Yeah. Or, so... you know, that, that multi-dimensional quarterback. Ryan Tannehill is a solid quarterback, mm-hmm. but he really thrives when he has that big weapon to take some of the pressure off of him. That's it. They're a, you know, they're a run heavy team. Everybody knows it that, yeah. you know, Derrick Henry is the guy on the team. I mean, you in the pantheon of elite running backs, he is in the top. You know, and just in terms of the team, he's basically he is like 98% of the team. Yeah, he is the majority of their offense to be sure. Um, you know, so I think anytime you're in that kind of situation, it's, yeah, I think it's going to be hard to, you're eventually going to find teams that have figured it out and how, and figured out how to stop it. Yeah. And every team will eventually. Yeah. So I'm kind of, yeah, they're sort of exactly, they, you knew they'd have a winning record, but you knew they'd have some losses from some teams that figured them out. A hundred percent. The Colts? Um... So we're going to, yeah, bump up to the Colts. Uh, I will tell you, I was actually in Las Vegas. This was right, literally right before the pandemic and the shutdown happened. Mm-hmm. Because you remember I was there when it when it started to shut down. Yeah. That's when we caught word that Philip Rivers had signed with the Colts. Yeah. The first thing I did was start to look at the odds for the Indianapolis Colts. To win the division? To win the Super Bowl. Ah! And they were still real high because they hadn't really factored in Phillip Rivers yet. Yeah. But I said to myself, I would not be surprised if Phillip Rivers won the Super Bowl with the Colts. Yeah. Um, Having seen them play... Uh, it's a little hard to see it because they keep shooting themselves in the foot. Well, that's sort of the problem. It's, (laughs) yeah. 
it's kind of the same problems. Not to say that he hasn't occasionally, you know, been interception heavy, but at the same time, there's been occasions when it, you know, he plays lights out. Uh, he technically would put up four touchdowns, except, you know, one or two are overturned because somebody on his team committed a penalty and it's called oh back. Oh, God. And the fact that they've won seven games... It just shows that there are... How many weeks have we looked at it and looked at the stat lines if we haven't been able to see the game and think to ourselves, my God, Phillip Rivers beat two teams that day. He beat the team they were playing and he beat his own team's stupidity. Yep. You know, I mean, just this uh, this last one where everybody saw the, the absolute meltdown. Oh my God. Five holding penalties on one drive. Yep. There are offensive line units that will not take five holding penalties in two or three games. And that was, you know, in the fourth quarter when it really mattered. Right, and despite all of that, Phil found a way to two-minute drive them to hell all the way down the field and tie it up and they won it. Yeah, you know, but it's like... But it's one of those things he won in spite of it. Yeah, you know, that he, he... puts up these, you know, these big numbers and all these touchdowns and things are called back and and is, you know, his offensive line is moving them backwards on the field sometimes, you know, repeatedly yeah, costing I mean, them down. How many down. times has he seen, you know, second and 20 or third and 20? It's been a uh, lot. I think there were some even more depressing like third and 30. Well, yeah, and you know, they they say the playbook becomes more open the shorter the yardage, so... Really aren't too many design plays for 3rd and 30. Yeah, you know, and he actually managed to convert on a couple of really insane 4th downs. I don't know how... Well, and that's that's a mark of... I, I would say probably his presence and his leadership as well, because he's getting the team to really respond to him and pull it out with him you know but it's just like yeah i mean it's kind of amazing that they didn't lose some of those games where yeah where they were going backwards down the field and that's that's my point is that they are seven and three could very easily right now be four and six yeah well and could go either way right like they in some ways, maybe they should be worse, but at the same time, the frustration that they could also be potentially better, like a couple of those games that they lost, they maybe could have won if they if they tidied up the penalties, the kind of the messy play. Well, that's the thing. If they could have trimmed down the number of penalties, you cannot, you're not going to have long-term success when you're averaging like 75 yards in penalties a game. Yeah, you know. Uh, especially for them and, you know, in the situation that they're in now where they're still, you know, duking it out with a, a really good team, the Titans, for, you know, to win the division. Yeah. The, so, you just, you got to get that under control. Exactly. And especially as we come down the stretch toward the playoffs, when every single penalty, the weight of it means so much more than in week four or week five. Yeah. You know, you hit... Well, Week sixteen, week seventeen, the wild card round. That those boneheaded penalties are going to be the difference between advancing and going home. Well, that's it, you know. And so it's just, you know, it's so you and I both like Phil as you know as a person, as a I quarterback, love him as a person. I respect the hell out of him as a quarterback. You know, he's such, and this was sort of the hope that getting away from the dysfunctional Chargers organization, going to, you know, a well-run, successful organization like the Colts to a coach that he knows really well in Frank Wright. Exactly, he reunited with Frank. That he would, you know, that he would have success. And he is, but, you know, I I just don't want to see... I thought it would have been a little more clear-cut. I don't want to see the, the, you know, the team shoot him in the foot, shoot themselves in the foot, you know. Yeah. It's already going to be difficult enough because, 
they're in the you know they're in the same conference with the Steelers and the Chiefs. So well, exactly. They've got to deal with the Steelers, the Chiefs, uh, and in, with just within their own division, they've got to deal with the Titans. Yeah, but even if they won the you know the division, only one AFC team can go to the Super Bowl and. Right. There's two teams that are playing much better than the Colts are. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, that eventually they'll have to deal with. Exactly. And that's, you know, the, the only thing why I think he would have a, an okay time with it, he's no stranger to the high-pressure games. Yeah. And he's no stranger to, you know, seeing some great players over his long and storied tenure in the NFL. Oh, exactly, you know, so, but yeah, so that was the hope, you know, was that he'd come and, and kind of be a wrecking ball, you know, with the the Colts. Right. And speaking so of wrecking guess... ball, let's, uh... <laughs> the Texans. Let's wrap this up with uh, unpackaging Houston and the wrecking ball that was uh, Bill O'Brien. Oh, my goodness. I mean, just so... earlier today, and you put it brilliantly, uh, with him trading away their best players. Mm -hmm. And not only that, trading away the majority of their draft picks. Yeah. Bill O'Brien gave, or did the, the literal textbook example of how to bring down an organization from within and cripple it. You know, I said, like, if you were maliciously going into an organization intending to cripple it, you could not have done a better job. No. That was that was precision assassin work. You know, because he not only got rid of the the best players or some of the best players that they already had, but he crippled their ability to get good right. players again through the draft. Now they'll have to rely on trade, you know, somehow. And he's disheartened so many people on that team that they're not going to want to stay. Well, that's the other problem, right? Uh, that... He may not have traded JJ away, but the fact that he, he made the team JJ's spirit away. Yeah, basically that JJ's made it pretty clear that it's he doesn't want to stay. Yeah, and by pretty clear means I'm not sticking I think he actually said I ain't sticking around for a rebuilding year. Yeah, you know, his contract is is coming up. Yeah. And he, he wants he knows that he doesn't have many years left and he wants a championship. He wants a championship and I think he wants to be I don't know. I think I think them as an organization still appreciate him. Oh yeah. But I think that he's just disheartened with the goings on. Well that's it. You know, I don't think it's so much that he, he doesn't feel appreciated. I think it's just, you know, when you know that maybe you only have three or four more years and you understand how fast time goes, which is what he said, you know, that when he started his career and they had struggles, you always think, well, you have three or five or ten more years to play, it's fine. Yeah, but he's now he knows he, Yeah, he knows he doesn't have ten more years to wait around for them to rebuild and fix this. And the thing is, he's not that old, it's just he's been banged up because he is such, you know, a physical yeah. player that his injuries have really caused his career to shorten. Well, that's it, you know. So it's just, yeah, Bill O'Brien may not have traded him away, but he's created a situation where, you know, J.J. will probably leave. Yeah, I think so. And, and any other of their good players who are still around may want to leave yeah, as well. I, I don't imagine Deshaun Watson's going to want to stick around for too long. Yeah, you know, trying to fix this. And it's just coming into this year... I never, never would have seen the destruction that is happening to the Houston Texans. No, definitely not. Um, you I know, legitimately they were expected them to be a playoff contender. Yeah, I mean, they were first the last two years. They were 11-5 in 2018, first in the division. They lost in the wild card. They were 10-6 and six last year, first again, lost in the division. Right, and that's, and that's what I mean. That, But uh, granted, again... As we sat there at the beginning of this season, you didn't think they were going to trade away DeAndre Hopkins. No. You know, so... But they did. I think once, but, I think once they did that, you, you kind of knew it was downhill. There was nowhere to go but down from there. When you... 
Especially on the fact that it was such a lopsided trade. Yeah. Like, if they would have um, got something even remotely close to the value and skill level of Hopkins. Yeah, except they didn't. <laughs> except they didn't. And then the fact that Bill O'Brien was just driving this guy to try to justify his stupidity. Well, that's it, you know, so it's just... Yeah, I mean, they're they're fighting hard for, for every game, but... But you know what it is, and especially, like I say, coming off uh, the literal ass-beating of the Detroit Lions on Thanksgiving, mm-hmm. what it shows me is that there's still some pride. Yeah. And there's still some heart, that they're, they haven't killed all of their spirit. And, mm-hmm. you know, we'll see. I mean, if maybe they're starting to gel with Romeo Cronell, who knows? Mm-hmm. That's true, you know, so I guess we'll see, but I'm not really surprised that they're at four and seven. Not considering what they've had to go through, but comparing it to the beginning of the season, never would have seen it coming. Yeah, you know, at the very beginning, yeah, you expected them to be, you know, number one or number two in the division. Absolutely. Just like they were the past couple of years. Yep. Yep. All right, well, that takes care of the AFC, so we're going to wrap this one up, and we'll come back. Uh, you want to stick around and come back, quote-unquote, next week to do the NFC? Oh, uh, yeah. All right, well, let's close this out with, as of right now, uh, recording this in the evening of Oct- of November the 27th. Yep, the Friday before the Sunday games. Right. Name me your AFC championship. Doors against. Oh uh, God! Anybody except the Chiefs? No, and here's why I don't think it's going to be the Chiefs. Mm. I think they're gonna just be too full of it. They're gonna come into the playoffs and they're gonna face somebody who's got nothing to lose, and they're gonna take them down. <laughs> Steelers versus the Jets in the championship. Well, that's that's that would be hilarious, but. No, I, I wouldn't be... Yeah. All right, looking at it right now, you know what I would love to see? What's that? And I'm not even going to lie. I would love to see Steelers-Browns AFC Championship. Mm-hmm. If I had my brothers, I'd love to see Steelers-Colts. You know, I love... Oh, no, Steelers-Colts Ste- would be an amazing AFC Championship. And again, but like I just said about the Chiefs, there's always that chance especially with the history of the trap games that the Steelers could lose in the first game of the playoffs. That's true. But they're playing, they're starting to gel, they're playing some strong football, so cautiously optimistic as the Steelers. Exactly. Uh, You got anything you want to close out with for related to the AFC? Nope, that's it. So that's it. So that's it for us. Uh, we're going to put a pin in this episode, wrapping up the AFC season in three-quarter review. Uh, so for here at the Carnival, I'm Zach. Rye's still I'm with Rye. me, And she's Rye. Uh, continue to stay safe. Stay indoors. Stay, you know, socially distant. Stay smart. And stay focused on football. Pet all the dogs. And all the dogs. <laughs> See you guys later.